So happy birthing person's day. There, I said it. I can't believe that's an actual real sentence. I actually text that Not sentence to my uh, sister-in-law a year ago, and I was told never to text that again. So. <laughs> <laughs> but today is Mother's Day. So for real, happy Mother's Day. And that, and that being said, uh, there's actually a, a, an effort in this country to, to change the name of Mother's Day to Birthing Person's Day. There's also a birthday coming up. There's also a birthday coming up. I'm, I'm not sure what that has to do with this, but yes, there is. <laughs> and, and, and we would argue that not everyone who... Yeah, we wouldn't argue that, but some people would argue. I'm so confused. But anyways, there are people that claim that not everyone who gives birth is a mother. But I think that that's how you become a mother. I just did the math here, but anyways. Uh, but we live in a country that's afraid of offending people. Yeah. And now we have to be careful about how we talk about even basic truth. But when I was growing up, I was told, you won't get in trouble for telling the truth. Well, that wasn't always true, though. You know, sometimes you did get in trouble because you would confess to doing something, and you know, I told you the truth, but yeah, you still did it, so there's still consequences to your actions. And, 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 and it should be expected that there are consequences to actions, right? Um, my, my friend, Pastor Ron Mullen, from the Simcoe Church, he posted on Facebook this week. Uh, someone said something around the, along the lines of everyone has the right to free choice, but that doesn't mean there's no consequences for your choice. And sometimes there's consequences for telling the truth. Sometimes you can say something true, and and it still offends people. But that doesn't make it less true, and it actually doesn't make it any less loving either. Because sometimes loving someone means telling them a truth that they don't want to hear. And this morning, we're here to celebrate mothers. And mothers are often put in that difficult position of telling their children hard truths in love. Sometimes as a parent, and especially as a mother, you need to say something that might hurt your, your, your kids' feelings. And you do this to help them learn and to help them grow and to help them survive and to help them become better people. You know, sometimes a mother needs to tell their son that those yellow Crocs don't go with that suit. Or, I, I love you, son, but you can't wear a, a red plaid tie with a green plaid shirt. Or you can't leave the house with holes in your pants. And, and, and these are all real conversations. But it, it, Well, the tie was me, not him, but yeah. uh, it doesn't matter. Parenting <laughs> at, at any age. As, as, as children, as children at age, the conversations and the consequences become harder and greater. Sometimes mothers have to tell their children that that person you're dating isn't, isn't right for you, isn't safe. Or those friends of yours aren't, aren't a great influence. And mothers have to be honest about school choices and career choices. And it's hard to tell the truth in love. And mothers are good at it. And, and fathers are okay at it. But sometimes, at least for me, we lean a little harder on the truth side than the love side. As a father, I've said things like, stop being a tool bag, tool bag. But a mother is more likely to, to be a little more sensitive in these situations. But still tell the truth. It's hard to hear. I think that's one of the, the greatest lessons I learned from my own mother. So tell the truth, even when people don't want to hear it. And I know I talk about this a lot, but the difference between love and tolerance is that love sometimes means telling people the truth that makes them upset or uncomfortable. And I also know that not everyone had the same experience that I had. And some of you, some of you didn't have good mothers. Like, I'm blessed to have the family I had. But not everybody else is. And, and last year, Angelina came and, and she shared a Mother's Day message that I could never give. And I'm sure it reached a, a group of people that I couldn't reach on Mother's Day. And it was honest, and it was brutal, and we'll put a link in the description later when we post this on YouTube. Because it might be the message that you need today, and I can't give it. Not everyone had a loving mother. So why do we celebrate Mother's Day in church? And that's actually a really good question. I mean, growing up, we went to church, and, and, and Mother's Day was just a given, because it was one of the big three services of the year. 
Now, Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day were the days that you could pretty much guarantee that the, the church would be full. There was a lot of people that only came to church on Mother's Day because that was the only day their mothers could guilt them into coming to church. And, and, and pastors loved that because they had a full, full service. But that's not a good enough reason to do Mother's Day. Because that's not a biblical reason. And everything we do needs to be influenced by the Bible. So why would we celebrate Mother's Day in church? I mean, let's, let's just look at the big three, right? Uh, Christmas, we celebrate God coming to earth, taking on human flesh in order to reconcile a fallen and sinful world to himself. See, Christmas is all about Jesus. And Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Good Friday, we, we commemorate the sacrificial death of Jesus. And the Bible makes it clear that no one killed Jesus. It was his life to lay down, to give up. And he chose to lay it down as a blood sacrifice to pay the debt we owe to God to sin. Jesus voluntarily gave his life on the cross. He descended to the grave. He conquered death and hell. And on Easter he rose and we celebrate that Jesus is alive and Jesus is God. And Easter is all about Jesus. But Mother's Day... Mother's Day isn't about Jesus, is it? Why do we celebrate it? Okay. Let's, uh, let's, let's open our Bibles, and I'm going to ask you to turn with me into Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. And Heidi's already read those to us. Okay, we'll talk after, okay? You have a seat. Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Now, if we're reading this, we might recognize right away that this is actually a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. So let's just quickly turn back to Deuteronomy, and, and then we'll, we'll come back to Ephesians this is going to be a lot of jumping around. I know this is not the way we normally we normally take one passage and work through it verse by verse, but today is going to be a jump around day. Yeah, it's going to be a jump around a day. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, so that you may have you may live long, and then it may go well with you. In the land the Lord your God has given you. Deuteronomy 5.16 is one of the Ten Commandments. If you're keeping, keeping track, it's actually number five. It comes right after honor the Sabbath and right before do not murder. So it's fairly important to God that you honor your father and mother. Back to, to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. It says the same thing, but then verse 4 gives instructions to fathers on how to act. See, the Bible is full of advice for fathers and instructions for fathers and warnings for fathers, and, and we'll probably get into that in a month from now. Because there's a lot. There's probably, we could probably do a whole series on it, but we'll, we'll do a day of it. But anyways... There's no real explicit instructions for mothers. And I'm not really sure why. I, it could be a cultural thing. It could be that, that wives had less say in certain things at that time. I, uh, women generally were not educated at that time. Or it could be that, that men just need more help at being good fathers. You know, for motherhood seems to come naturally for some women, but uh, every father has a hard time learning how to do it. I don't know that there... I, I really don't know. I do know that there are way more examples of, of good mothers in the Bible than there are good fathers in the Bible. It's really hard to find an example of a good father in the Bible. There's a few, but you gotta you gotta stretch it. Like I don't know. 
And we might look some of those up next month too. We'll see. But when, we're, when we read about follies in the Bible, even the great heroes of the faith, we read about David and Gideon and Eli and Samuel and, and, and even Moses' brother Aaron. And then we read about their sons that didn't follow God. And, and fatherhood is hard. And the Bible is full of poor fathers. And yet we're commanded in Deuteronomy and instructed in Ephesians to honor your father and mother. Now one thing that really stands out at me about this passage is that we're to honor our fathers and mothers. And at that time, that would have been a pretty radical thing. Because in that time, and in a lot of cultures at that time, wives weren't really that honored. In biblical time, especially in the Old Testament, especially in Deuteronomy, you know, wives were considered property. They were taken as spoils of war. Yet God commands his people to honor your mother. This is a radical thought for that time. But we see lots of examples of it through the Bible. And we see lots of examples of, of, of good mothers through the Bible as well. In Genesis, we see mothers having influences not only on their husbands, but their sons as well. Sarah loved her son Isaac. Abraham, not a great father, especially of his first son. But Sarah made sure that her son was looked after. Isaac and Rebecca, they raised two sons. And we see Rebecca very involved in her son's lives, especially in Jacob's life. And Jacob becomes Israel, and his descendants are the chosen people of God. And the only reason he received a blessing from his father Isaac was because of his mother's actions. Then we read about Jacob's son Judah, who refers to his daughter-in-law Tamar as more righteous than he. And we just talked about David. Well, his son Solomon was the wisest man of his time. And we read in 1 Kings, when Bathsheba went to Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, the king stood up to meet her, bowed down to her, sat on his throne, and he had a throne brought for the king's mother, and she sat down at his right hand. He had a throne brought for his mother. His mother who was instrumental in making sure that his father crowned him as king. Here we, we, we read about Solomon honoring his mother by bowing before her and having a throne brought in for her. The wisest man who ever lived demonstrates to his kingdom and to all of us how important it is to honor your mother. Later on in 1 Kings, when Elijah, the prophet of God, a man used by God to raise the dead, to speak truth to power, to call fire from heaven on multiple occasions. We always forget about the second time. We always remember the first time with the prophets of Baal and the fire comes down and melts the rocks. But we always forget about the second time where he calls down fire and 50 soldiers are killed. And then 50 more soldiers come and he calls down fire again. God used Elijah in miraculous ways. And Elijah calls Elisha to become his apprentice. And Elisha says to him, I have one request. First Kings. Elisha went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen. And he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said. And then I will come with you. You got 12 yoke of oxen. Like, that's a pretty big farm. That, that's, a, that's a pretty rich guy. He's, he's turning his back on, on that as well. You're like, yeah. That'd be a really nice tractor nowadays. <laughs> and, and, and Elijah is presented with an opportunity of a lifetime, though, to study under Elijah. Now, I want you to think about this. Imagine you get a call from Elon Musk saying, I want you to come learn how to make electric cars. 
I get a call from, I don't know, Jordan Peterson inviting you to study psychology directly under him. Or, or Mark Knopfler calls you up and he says, I'm gonna, I want to teach you how to play guitar. And how would you respond? Would you leave immediately? I know I would if I got that call from Mark. Because, you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> but Elisha says, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. Elisha honors his father and mother. I don't know if we understand how radical the idea of honoring one's mother was at that time. See, Solomon, he would go on to have a thousand wives. And, and he built a palace for one of them. But we only read about him bowing and getting a throne for his mother. Only his mother said it was right side. Elijah had the opportunity of a lifetime and he stalls to kiss his father and mother goodbye. In the New Testament, we read about Timothy having the faith of his mother and grandmother. I'm, I'm going to ask that you, you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I, I know it's, it's very different than the way we normally do things. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promised life that is Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that you may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and then your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives with you also. See, it's, it's very likely that, that Paul's, or not Paul, that Timothy's father was Greek. I mean, you can guess that probably by the name, that's a, an easy giveaway, but also he wasn't raised Jewish. We, as we read on in the Bible, we, we read that he was, he was never circumcised. Um, but he had a sincere faith. He believed in God. And he would have got that from his grandmother and from his mother. Timothy learned how to love Jesus by watching his mother. I mean, here we have a, a New Testament example of a godly mother and of a man who honored her. The Bible is full of, of, of people honoring their mothers. But the greatest example of this is Jesus. You see, Jesus honored his mother. As Christian people who claim to follow Jesus, we claim to be representatives of Jesus on this earth, and, and we, try, we try to represent Jesus with our lives. One of the ways you can represent Jesus with your life is by honoring your mother. And we're going to look at a couple of examples of how Jesus honored his mother. John chapter 2 shows us Jesus' first miracle. Just trust your bookmarks and they'll be there. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, There's no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you, tells you to do. So here we have Jesus hanging out at a wedding. He's hanging out with his buds. He's hanging out with the disciples. Have you ever been someplace hanging out with your friends and then your mother comes to nag you to do something? <laughs> and you just want to hang out with the guys, right? And then Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. And his mother comes up to him. And he, not only does she come up to him to talk to him, she comes to him with a problem that they're out of wine. And so we can guess that from the context of this that Mary was probably in some sort of position of authority in this wedding. You know, maybe it was one of Jesus' siblings 
and was getting married. We don't know. All we know is that Mary seems to, to have some sort of authority here. She seems to be in charge of something. We also know that, that Mary knows who Jesus is. She knows he, he's special. She knows better than anyone else the circumstances of his birth. She is fully aware that Jesus is the Son of God. And the wedding runs out of wine. And she turns to Jesus and he's there with his friends. And if my wife turned to my son and said, we're out of wine, his response would have been, well, that sounds like a you problem. <laughs> but, but Jesus honors his mother. And he says to his mother, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my, honor, my hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And Jesus then turns water into wine. And that's the beginning of his ministry. Jesus' first miracle is done at the request of his mother. Now I think just so we all understand, it's, it's, it's kind of important to turn out, to, to point out that in Greek, calling your mother woman wasn't a bad thing. Like in English, that we would find that a little offensive. We, we might think that that's disrespectful. But it was, a, it was an ordinary term of endearment. There was no disrespect in referring to his, his mother this way. Just like there's no disrespect in referring to today as Mother's Day instead of birthing person's day or whatever we're supposed to call it. See, see, Mary was a woman. And just like all birthing people, all mothers, no, all, all birthing people are mothers, and all mothers are women, Jesus honored his mother by turning water into wine at the wedding. And we honor our mothers by doing what we're asked instead of responding with, that's a you problem. But I think we've all been guilty of that too in the past. I know I have. A second example of Jesus honoring his mother is found in John chapter 19. I know. I have, ex I have extra bookmarks too, and this is the problem. <laughs> Well, I'm already working on next week, so that's okay. Uh, a second example of Jesus honoring his mother is John 19, beginning in verse 25. Near the cross, Jesus, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. While Jesus is suffering, dying on the cross, bearing the sins of all humanity, he takes the time to look down and see his mother. And when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. Jesus is about to leave this earth. But before he does, one of the last things he does is to make sure his mother is looked after when he's gone. We know that Jesus had brothers and sisters. We know some of their names. Matthew 13, 55 says, Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't his sisters among us? And it's plural, sisters. That's interesting too, though. The sisters aren't named. It gives you an idea of the culture and how radical it was that God would command his people to honor their mothers. Because elsewhere, the sisters don't even get names. But just for clarity, you know, if we read this list of, of names, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, that's not the same Judas that betrayed Jesus, just so we know. And, and that's not the same James, because he had two disciples named James. It's neither one of them. This is a different James as well. Some people think that the Judas is the one who wrote Jude, the, the book of the Bible. 
and then James is the one who wrote James, the book of the Bible, but we really don't know for sure. We know that they were written by people named Judas and James, we just don't know which ones. So. We also know that Jesus knew that, that John was going to... We know that, that uh, Jesus knew that, that John was probably going to live the longest of his disciples. And Jesus had a responsibility as the oldest son to look after his mother. And dying on the cross, he takes the time to honor his mother and he asks his disciple to take care of her. He puts John in charge of looking after his mother before giving his life for humanity because Jesus honored his mother on the cross. But why do we celebrate Mother's Day? Because that's the whole question we've been asking all day, isn't it? Well, we honor God by honoring our mothers. Whether we're reading the Ten Commandments or reading Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we're commanded and instructed to honor our father and mother. It's the fifth commandment and the first one of promise. God promises long life to those who honor their mother and father. And that might just be a simple function of, of obeying your parents. Because let's face it, your parents want what's best from you, for you. Your mother's going to say things, she's going to give you advice like, slow down, don't drive so fast. Be careful. Don't do drugs, eat vegetables, look after yourself. And, and this kind of advice generally leads to longer life. So, so honor your mother and it helps you live longer. And, and secondly, we see the example of men of God honoring their mothers and their mother's teaching throughout the Bible. From the first five books of the Bible to the epistles at the end, we find examples of good mothers and righteous women. I mean, I, I didn't even, I didn't get into 2 John which is written to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love, whom I love in the truth. Not only I, but all who know the truth. The Bible is full of examples of good mothers and examples of sons honoring their mothers. From Bathsheba to Lois and Eunice, the mother and grandmother of Timothy. So we honor our mothers because of the example given us by the people of God who've gone before us. We honor our mothers because Jesus taught us to. Jesus honored his mother from the beginning to the end of his earthly ministry. And we, as his disciples, honor Jesus by honoring our mothers. So this, this, this group, this fellowship of joy, exists to share the joy of the Lord with our community and to serve Jesus by serving our neighbors. And we can share the joy of the Lord by celebrating Mother's Day. Celebrate your mother. Celebrate the love they share and the values they model. We can serve Jesus by honoring our mothers. And today we have an opportunity to honor Jesus by celebrating the mothers in your life. Now, you might not have had a, good, a great birth mother. That might be a reality. You might not even know who your birth mother is or who your mother is at all. Or, or maybe your mother's passed away. Maybe you were abandoned or abused. But there's likely an older woman in your life, an aunt, a grandmother, a teacher, a friend, that spoke uncomfortable truths to you in love. So you can honor them today. And for a lot of people in this room, your, your mother has passed away, but you likely know a younger mother that could use some help, that could use some love, that could use some encouragement. So share the joy of the, the Lord by honoring and blessing younger mothers today. Reach out and give a word of encouragement. Maybe tell a joke. Maybe find out what they need and, and help them with a real physical need. Honor Jesus by honoring the mothers in your life, no matter who they are, older or younger or anybody around you. This week I encourage everyone here to find a mother, any mother, 
and let them know that Jesus loves you. Happy Mother's Day. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for our mothers. We thank you that one day a year we, we gather to, to honor them, and we pray that we honor them all year. We pray that we learn from them. We thank you that they speak truth and love. And we pray that we will learn that lesson and we will speak truth and love even when it makes people uncomfortable. And in all things, we love and praise you, Lord Jesus. As we pray, Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.